Hi, welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, producer and host of the FIT webinar series. Today, our presentation features domestic travel opportunities in the coming winter season. The late summer is a time when many people are making winter travel plans, and we thought you might like to learn more about our offerings in the January through March period. We are excited also to use this opportunity to introduce Kevin Burke to the Vent community. A resident of North Carolina, Kevin is the newest addition to our tour leader team. He will co-lead five of our winter tours and will join this presentation in real time. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Now we'll turn to Victor Emanuel for his opening remarks. Okay, my first opening remarks is I want to congratulate our our uh, webinar coordinator, uh, Ben Reynolds, on his 20th wedding anniversary for he and his wife, Jessica. So congratulations to Ben and Jessica. Thank you. 20 years, their wedding anniversary. Now, to start my opening remarks, uh, these are all wonderful tours, and most of them are almost full, but we want to make a special offer. It it's like if you try to pick one of them, it's like being in a restaurant and there are three different things on the menu you want to order. My answer is take all of them. But if you take three of them, you'll get a $200 discount per tour that you take. As I say, most of them are already full. Winter is a wonderful time to bur for birding these areas and it will add a lot to your year. It will be something to look forward to. It's something you will enjoy and you will find each of these tours absolutely remarkable. I've done all of them. Now I'm going to make some, show some slides and make some remarks about each tour. Okay, these are the winter domestic tours. And we'll start with the one in uh, New Mexico, which one of our absolutely most terrific leaders, Barry Zimmer, is the prime leader with our new uh, leader, Kevin Burke. And winter New Mexico has a, it goes all the way from El Paso all the way up to Albuquerque. And all the way, you're seeing wonderful scenery and birds. But you start in New Mexico with an incredible beginning because you go to a spot where the one of the great birds of North America, the yellow-headed blackbird, winter. Then you also see a lot of winter birds, the Prado Dipmouse, the Burring Owl, the Kerrville Thrasher, the Greater Red Runner, and the Kerrville Thrasher. Every place you stop, they're wonderful winter birds. There are also mountain birds that in certain years come down out of the mountains the mountain bluebird. One year when I did the trip, there was a, tri uh, a bush that had 20 mountain bluebirds all roosting on the same bush. We can't guarantee that every year, but it was a, a, a year, some years the mountain birds come down out of the mountains and it's a fantastic sight. And you also go after going up the mountains, I mean, going up toward Albuquerque, you go to one of the greatest birding areas in the United States, the Bosque del Apache which is next to the Rio Grande River, a area of flooded area where there are sandhill cranes and there are, are ducks and there are hawks. And one of my favorite things is the Ross's geese. Living in Texas, I'd never seen that many of them. There you get flocks of Ross's geese. And the last time I did the tour, we asked the people on the refuge, Mary and I, where do they go to roost? And he said, well, there's a, there's a little lake right next to the highway. I think they'll roost there. We went there. There was nothing in the roost, roosting on the lake. And all of a sudden, one came in, 10 came in, 20 came in, 100 came in, 500 came in, all into that area roosting in that lake right next to the highway. And they, they kind of milled around for about 30 minutes, an hour. And then they took off and went to their winter, to their to their real roosting site for the for the night. So there's so much going on at Bosque del Apache, one of the great birding sites. I remember when Roger Torrey Peterson went there, how thrilled he was with it. He told me about it. So that is one of the incredible ending highlights of this amazing winter New Mexico. The other tour I want to talk about after winter New Mexico is the tour that goes right after it. You go to winter Southern California. And it's very easy to connect these two tours. You can go from El, pa El Paso over to San Diego and connect to winter Southern California. It's easy to connect those two tours and just keep in that area in the winter, both great winter places to be. 
and uh, with Brennan Maroney, who lives there and knows where everything is, along again with Kevin Burke. So it's a great combination of winter Arizona with winter Southern California. I can't think of a better place to spend part of your winter than combining those two tours. Again, Southern Arizona is one of the great birding places in the United States as you get the birds coming up from the from uh, in Mexico, Mexico into Arizona. We also have birds coming down in the winter. So you have a combination. Uh, I've done this tour a number of times. And uh, of course, the weather is, un is unpredictable. Well, one time on a day with Barry Zimmer, we did have a, a snowstorm, a brief snowstorm. It was only very brief. We were dressed for it. And the trees were beautiful with the snow on them. And then I, we went up in the mountains to some hummingbird feeders. There was a hummingbird feeder covered with snow. And the hummingbird just poked its bill through the snow and fed on the, on the uh, food that was there for the hummingbird. It only lasted briefly. But it's an amazing place, southern Arizona, in the winter. It's very different than it is on our spring tour and our summer tour, a whole different experience of winter southern Arizona. Again, one of Barry Zimmer's favorite places. And he and Kevin will do a fantastic job of leading it. So I recommend that, and uh, that can be combined with either of the other two tours, with the winter, the California, uh, Mexico, or the winter. winter uh, they all can be combined. Okay, Nebraska, Sand Hill Cranes and Prairie Chickens. I'd heard about it for years, but I hadn't gone because I've seen Sand Hill Cranes many times. They winter in Texas. They, they used to winter right near Austin, and I, I hadn't gone to see them. And years ago, with my friends from Colorado, we drove from Colorado to Nebraska. And we were all overwhelmed what we saw when we got there. I've been all around the world, I've been to every continent, but I would say that this Nebraska spectacle is the greatest birding and nature spectacle in the world. If you haven't done it, you must do it. And if you have done it, you will wanna do it again. It will absolutely be astounding to you to see the thousands and thousands of sandhill cranes coming in to, to, to spend the night and leaving in the morning. It is an amazing experience. And there are ducks to see and, and sparrows to see and other birds to see. And it combines with the prairie chickens dancing, which again is one of the great spectacles of the world. There are a few members of this family in Europe and Asia, but none that dance like the prairie chickens one of the most amazing dances in the world. Dance is better than any of us could do. And uh, I'll never forget the first ones I saw when I was a kid, how impressed I was with them. So the combination of the Sandhill Cranes and the Prairie Chickens is an amazing tour. Uh, I highly recommend it. And you'll be doing it with Rick Wright, who grew up in Nebraska and loves Nebraska and will be a great person to share it with. And you'll be better to go with him than go on your own because he knows so much about it. You'll learn so much more. And uh, he mentioned to that January, go a day early as you can because there's also a wonderful museum there. But all of these tours will give you an amazing winter, something to look forward to, something to remember. And as I say, if you take three of them, you get a $200 discount on any of them. And I want to remind you that they're all nearly full. So thank you for listening to the comments about these tours. Now I'm going to turn things over to Barry to talk about some other winter tours. Victor, Victor uh, just covered the winter New Mexico tour, and I am going to actually uh, go to the end slide on this because with each of these uh, tour profiles here, uh, I, I conclude with a slide similar to this because I do want to show some of the, the important information for each of these tours uh, at greater length, for example, um, you know, we are talking about these, the, the, the 2024 departures. However, we are also including the 2025 dates. On that note, if you have, if you, uh, if, if you've not visited our website lately, 99% uh, of our offerings for 2025 are up on our website now, including these domestic departures. Uh, uh, that will take place in the winter months. Um, so winter New Mexico, uh, we have our tour operations manager for this trip is Penny Seda and Penny is assisted by Renee Shields. You can see their email addresses there followed by our office phone numbers if 
this trip is of interest to you. One thing that I do want to, uh, that I would like to add to Victor's comments about this trip is that early in my career, I co-led this tour with Barry Zimmer three times. And uh, it's been a long time, but it is, I, the memories are still strong. Just the combination of birds of the desert Southwest, birds of the Rocky Mountain West, wintering species, and also uh, as an added feature, this tour has a long, long record of some of 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 seeing and often finding some very rare out of range stray birds. So there's just a lot of excitement that can that goes along with winter New Mexico, winter Southern California. Uh, again, uh, this is a tour that, as Victor mentioned, will be co-led by Brennan Mulrooney, who lives in San Diego, and Kevin Burke, and. One of the joys of this trip is that you uh, it operates in a fairly concise area. Uh, I have maps to illustrate the routes of all these trips, but uh, Southern California is a fairly large place. So I wanted to, to pinpoint where exactly this trip operates. It's in and out of San Diego and you spend time along the coast. Certainly you spend time in the mountains. And then you go out into the lower desert around the, El, the town of El Centro and the Salton Sea. Uh, in a very short period of time, this tour is about a week. Uh, in a very short period of time, you see a, a, a substantial variety of birds and also birds in good numbers. And one of the reasons, there are a number of reasons why we wanted to profile these trips, but um, certainly because, uh, you know, who want who doesn't want to get away from uh, the winter time, uh, you know, and go to a place like San Diego where you've got birds like Allen's hummingbirds, um, Lawrence's goldfinch, California quail, California gnatcatcher, Ridgeway's rail. All these are specialty birds. There's actually a California thrasher. So these are birds that can all be seen along the coast and in the foothills. Victor was mentioning the rail, the the Ridgeway's rail. A number of years ago, this species was split off of clapper rail, and uh, it is, uh, and it, it can be remarkably tame. Uh, they're almost habituated in places around the bay, and this is a bird that we target because there's very few places in the United States to see this bird, only in the coastal California and actually the lower Colorado River Valley. And then you've got the coast. The big open beaches of San Diego, the concentrations of birds on San Diego Bay. These are really sort of iconic images that you would identify with Southern California, particularly the San Diego area in the wintertime. Of course, there are a handful of Pacific Coast specialty birds like the Hearman's Gull pictured in the bottom left, Western Gull in the bottom right, Black Oyster Catcher bottom center. Maybe the most beautiful gull, I think, in the United States, the Hearman's gull. Yeah, it's a spectacular thing. This is an adult bird. And one thing about Hearman's gulls is that there is there seems to be a, 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 a medium to long term trend that this bird has not been doing as well. But nevertheless, Southern California, they breed in the in the, the Baja region of Mexico and the Gulf of California. And they come up as post breeding wanderers in the fall and winter and they they're on the beaches of san diego so it's a beautiful bird easy to see at this time of year winter southern california again uh, brennan mulrooney and kevin burke we are down to three spaces available on this particular tour uh we do if next year doesn't work for you we do have the tour uh operating again with brennan uh, perhaps Kevin as well in 2025. And um, this tour is operated by Patrick Swaggerty and Patrick is assisted by Virginia Brown. Uh, you can contact either of them if you are interested in reserving one of the remaining spaces on this tour. Uh, winter Southern Arizona, which Victor also touched on. This is a tour that will again be led by the combination of Barry Zimmer and Kevin Burke. These are the, the January dates for 2024. And one of the fun things about this trip is 
Not a lot of people know this because when they think about Southern Arizona, uh, quite naturally, uh, almost instinctively, we think about the spring and the summer months, being there in the monsoon season when all the specialty birds are around, the birds that frankly draw birders from all over the country and even the world in some cases, to see a range of species that are found only on those US-Mexico borderlands uh, and perhaps nowhere better than in Southeast Arizona. However, uh, the draw of going there in the winter time is that it is a fantastic place for birding. And as I say, not a lot of people know this because a number of those specialty birds of the summer are not present in the winter. However, a great many of them are. And in addition to that, you've got a great combination of wintering songbirds, waterfowl, and also it's a great place to see sandhill cranes. And an interesting phenomena of recent years is that the numbers of sandhill cranes wintering in Southeast Arizona has really grown substantially. So there are now actually, uh, I believe tens of thousands, 10 or 20,000 of them that can be found in Southeast Arizona in the winter time. Here is a range map that shows that centers on the city of Tucson, Arizona. And this is the general area that we operate. We range northwest of Tucson, we go south of Tucson, and we certainly go east to Wilcox and the Sulphur Springs Valley. And the hawks are wonderful too, wintering there, wintering hawks in different plumages. A great place to see them. So, as I say, a number of what we think of as Arizona specialty birds are present throughout the year. And this is a representation of what is possible. Kilo woodpecker, painted red start, Mexican jay, vermilion flycatcher, Rivoli's hummingbird, yellow-eyed junco. I could keep on going, but I just wanted to illustrate the presentation with some of the things that you have a very high probability of seeing. Most hummingbirds are present in the spring and summer, but you would be surprised uh, including the rare violet crown hummingbird, which is also present through the winter months in some years. Those aforementioned species occur right alongside these winter birds. Victor had referenced the hawks a moment ago. This is, Southeast Arizona is one of the premier places in the country to see ferruginous hawk. You don't just go out and see one or two of these, you see numbers of them in a day, including the less frequently seen dark morph. Um, again, uh, the, the sandhill cranes that are out in the Wilcox Playa and the place called the Whitewater Draw. And then beyond that, we just never know what we're going to see. This is, a, this is another representation of what occurs on our tour. Birds like Williamson Sapsucker, the beautiful and very unusual looking Lewis's woodpecker. Lawrence's goldfinch, a bird from uh, Southern California, Central California that wanders all the way over into the Southwest. I the think the Lewis's time. woodpecker is the most wonderful woodpecker in the United States, one you must see. And Southeast Arizona is a pretty good place for it. Green-tailed towhee. And again, everybody, it, 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 it's not so much, the point of this is not so much to, uh, to, to name species by species what you'll see, but uh, to, to offer a sort of a vision of what, of what, uh, of the dynamic quality of the winter season in Arizona. This tour, uh, again, led by Barry Zimmer and Kevin Burke. You can see those are our upcoming tour dates this January and also for the ensuing January. Uh, they're, they're very similar. They're only different by two days adjusted for the calendar. Um, this trip departs and ends in Tucson. The manager for this trip, again, is Patrick Swaggerty, uh, assisted by Virginia Brown. For a different take on the winter season, we have Northern Minnesota Winter Weekend. Some people will recoil <laughs> hearing the name Minnesota Winter Weekend. Other people will probably be intrigued. And uh, for, for those of our listeners here, for those of our attendees who may be a little curious or uncertain of what, why we would go to Minnesota, Northern Minnesota in the winter, the answer is because there are a range of very special birds that are best seen at the winter season 
And they are birds that are generally denizens of the far north. They are, for most people in most parts of the country, you really have little to no chance of seeing these birds, uh, except on very unusual circumstances. But Minnesota is a place where people can, can, can go and have a, a, and consistently have a good chance of seeing a range of these very localized and special birds. It's a short trip. I'm going to back up so as you can see the dates on this thing. February 1 through 5, uh, 2024 is our upcoming departure. And when we talk about northern Minnesota, what specifically are, do we mean? Well, uh, the, the, the city of Duluth on Lake Superior. And, you know, the, the, what we do from uh, year to year certainly varies but we consistently spend time in and around Duluth. We go into the Superior National Forest and we go into the famous Saxim Bog. And in some ways you could, you could almost categorize the types of birds um, into classes of things that people want to see or families. For instance, owls, it's always a big deal to see owls. And this is uh, quite probably the single most attractive draw for most birders. Snowy owl is annual. Great gray owl is resident uh, in some years, increased by numbers of birds coming down from the north. Northern hawk owl coming down out of Canada. And of course, these birds join with uh, resident species like great horned owl and barred owl. And I have a barred owl um, featured here on the bottom left. Our track record with seeing these special owls is quite good. Um, needless to say, we can't ever guarantee these things. Northern hawk owl does not occur every year, but it occurs some years and we do see it. Uh, great gray owl is around uh, every year and we typically see it. I don't know that we've ever missed it. We certainly get it most years. And snowy owls are around too. There's usually at least one or two around every year. And in some years, in invasion years, there can, they can be actually quite numerous. So owls, a big draw for this trip, as are a range of other things. Uh, winter finches, for example, evening grosbeak here, uh, top center, bottom right, pine grosbeak, and then uh, bottom left center uh, is a, an image of a feeder filled with common red poles. So... How would you like to have that as a yard bird? Common a flock of common red poles coming into your yard. So these winter finches are also a big draw. Species that again are not easily seen in other parts of the country. There is a Canada jay, black-backed woodpecker, Bohemian waxwing. Uh, these are very special birds of the northern tier of the continent. Um, Bohemian waxwings are around most years. Again, it is, a, it is an invasion type species. So in some years, there are a lot more of them around than others. And then in the bottom left, I also have an image of a rough grouse here. So, you know, uh, that is a bird uh, and sometimes even spruce grouse that we're fortunate to get on this tour. Now, as far as it goes, yes, it's cold. Obviously it's cold, but you know, if you dress warmly and you go with the right frame of mind, people love this tour. We, uh, it generally does well every year in terms of attracting interest. And it's consistent for producing these very special birds. And it's short, so you can always warm up when you get home. Northern Minnesota winter weekend. Uh, Eric Brunke and Kevin Burke. February 1 through 5, 2024. And uh, this trip is also managed by Patrick and assisted by Virginia. Once again, uh, I display their contact information here uh, in case you want to reserve one of the remaining spaces on this tour. And Eric Brunke lives in Duluth, so he knows everything about that area. So it's wonderful to go with the tour where one of the leaders is right there and is in touch with everything going on. That is, I'm glad you pointed that out, Victor. Eric, Eric uh, designed this trip for us actually a number of years ago. Spring Hawaii. Uh, 
So you see the word spring and you may wonder why is this tour mentioned with our winter tour as well? The answer is because technically this tour does fall within the winter season. Uh, February 27th through March 8th, of course, is getting near the very end of winter. And uh, it is, well, it's Hawaii. And so who, especially in the middle of winter, doesn't want to go to Hawaii? So we also included this tour in with the others. Now, I'm going to profile this tour, but I do want to mention something. Um, we have had a big surge of interest in this tour, and our 2024 departure is actually sold out now. And uh, this occurred very recently, but I am going to profile the trip because I do want to share. Uh, I want to say a couple of things that I think are important about this tour. I want to share some images, but also to inform you that this trip will operate in 2025. It is up on our website and uh, we are certainly taking registrations for it. We are, we are available for that. Uh, I guess the first thing that I'm going to lead with here before I jump into a short profile of this tour is I will admit that it's a little bit awkward talking about uh, a Hawaiian vacation right now when we all know uh, of the catastrophic event that occurred there with the destruction of the city of Lahaina on Maui due to a major conflagration. Our tours, I will say first off that our tours do not visit Maui so as far as that goes, the tours will not be affected. On another note, though, uh, obviously this is a tragedy. We know people who live on Maui and, uh, or who have lived on Maui. So it's, I think that we're, everybody in society is in agreement um, that this has just been a terrible loss. With that being said, uh, we, we will indeed offer it, operate a trip in Hawaii this coming spring. It will be led by Eric and Kevin. And one of the things that, uh, that I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what our Hawaii tour does. It visits three islands, the island of Oahu, where it spends the first couple of days. It then goes up to the island of Kauai. And then from Kauai, we finish on the big island, where actually we spend most of our time. And one of the things that I want to point out about this is that... Um, you know, while on the one hand, everybody wants to see the special birds of Hawaii, and we we, we do our best to provide that. Uh, Hawaii, there's a there are a host of variables that make birding challenging there, but we generally do a pretty good job of getting the, the endemic birds that are available to us. But Hawaii offers a lot more than that. Obviously, there's the scenery. I mean, Hawaii is Hawaii is romanticized, it's iconic. And so there is a genuine curiosity to see the place that extends beyond just getting there to see the birds. I very seldom, within context of these discussions, uh, will talk about the products that are being offered by com our competitors, but I'm gonna make an exception on this one and I'm gonna do it because um, what we have found, what we have seen is that most companies that are offering birding tours to Hawaii, what they're doing is they're figuring out ways to offer as concise a trip as possible so that you get into Hawaii, you go from island to island, you see as many of the birds as you can in as little time as you can, and then you go home. We had a big meeting last fall amongst all of us involved in the Hawaii program to discuss the vent tour. What is it about our tour that we like? What do we think could be improved about it? One of the bits of information, of feedback that we have received uh, from time to time in the last couple of years is that our tour can seem a bit rushed at times. So we responded to that by adding an extra day in on the island of Oahu. So what it does is it gives you more time to see the special birds, but it just gives you more time to enjoy, the, uh, to enjoy a trip to Hawaii at a more relaxed pace. And we are proud of our trip. It is a little bit longer. It is a little pricier than what our competitors offer, but we are perfectly okay with that because we are happy with our product. And I'm going to show you some of the birds. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a slide of a number of the endemic species. In some ways, with the land birds, you can you can classify them as little red ones and little yellow ones. 
And the red ones are the, the, the beautiful and renowned Eevee in the top left and the equally beautiful Apapani on the top right. Uh, the Palila on the bottom left, um, it's a, a bit more of a distant shot, but it's this beautiful little uh, gray and yellow finch with a black face. It has gotten to be difficult uh, to find. We, we have been getting it, but it is a difficult bird. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that these Hawaiian, a number of these Hawaiian uh, native bird species are struggling. And this is an example of one that is. Uh, I won't get into the reasons for that. We don't have time, but uh, it is a bird that we look for on the slopes of Mauna Kea on the Big Island. And in the top center is the Hawaii Amakihi, which is a widespread native bird that actually is doing quite well. Uh, bottom center, if anybody, if anybody, uh, even if you've never been to Hawaii, if anybody had to, was asked to name uh, a native bird that they would like to see, it may well be the Nene, the Hawaiian goose, the native Hawaiian goose, which also happens to be the state bird. Um, there are numbers of places to see that. The bottom right, the Hawaiian hawk, an endemic bird. But the land birds are seen in complement to the seabirds. Or maybe it's the other way around. The seabirds are seen in complement to the land birds. Our spring tour visits some fabulous places to see seabirds. I personally feel that Kilauea Point National Wildlife Refuge on the island of Kauai is one of the single neatest places that I've ever been. Standing on, standing on the bluffs, the promontories overlooking the Pacific Ocean as the big waves come rolling in to crash off the cliffs all the while there are laison albatross on the ground. Um, sometimes uh, you, you can see two species of tropic birds. Here I have the red-tailed tropic bird, great frigate birds, red-footed boobies. All these birds are nesting there. And it is truly a wonder to visit this place and to see these beautiful things flying all around you. On the island of Oahu, right around the hotel, near Kapiolani Park, we see the white tern beautiful white tern and they're nesting. And then uh, we often see the black knotties off the coast of the big island at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Beyond birds, um, the, 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 the time that we spend, um, you know, and again, we are Victor Emanuel nature tours, not just Victor Emanuel birding tours. And so we make a point of seeing some of these other special birds, or special uh, forms of life. Pacific green sea turtles, and a number of our trips are quite for, are quite lucky and get to see the very rare and endangered Hawaiian monk seal that comes up on the beaches, usually on the island of Kauai, but even on the island of Oahu sometimes where they see them. So that's fun. Uh, seeing these other things in addition to the birds just makes for a richer trip. And of course, Hawaii is also known for its scenery. The beautiful coastal scenery as demonstrated in a couple of these images and in the top center, that is Waimea Canyon, which is sometimes uh, colloquially referred to as the Grand Canyon of the Pacific. This highly eroded volcanic formations that formed Waimea Canyon. When you're up there on the view, the overlooks looking down, it's like a rainbow of color in the sediments that, that uh, I'm sorry, that in the these eroded volcanic soils. So uh, birds, mammals, reptiles, and scenery. Um, Spring Hawaii, again, this trip is sold out for 2024. Um, it's a more recent development, but you can see the dates for 2025, March 5 through 15 with, uh, again, Eric Brunke will be leading that trip. Um, we'll see if Kevin will be leading it, but um, we are in the process of, of actually formulating his 2025 schedule. But anybody with an interest in Hawaii who can't go next year may be interested to know that we'll be offering it again the following year. And to underscore what Mary said, if you're going to go all the way to Hawaii, why not spend an extra day, which we've added to our trips? If you're going to go all that way, don't have a rush trip. Take advantage of being here. And again, this is the, the Nebraska trip that Victor was talking about. Um, in his opening remarks. I want to add something to this also uh, that, that relates some of my own experiences. Um, in the early years of my career, I was fortunate to lead this trip 
I think twice with a man named Kim Eckert, who uh, is now retired, but who used to lead this trip for Ben. And until up until this year, it had probably been 20 years or even more since I had been there. And frankly, I had forgotten what this experience is like. This spring, I was fortunate to co-lead a private trip to the Platte River region to see the Sandhill Cranes and then go out west uh, to the western, uh, the, well, the, the southwestern part of the state to see the prairie chickens. And it was a mesmerizing, unforgettable experience. As, as Victor pointed out, this is, not, this is not just a national experience. This is a global wildlife phenomenon to see the Sandhill Cranes. At first glance, if you if you do not know anything about Nebraska or this uh, crane spectacle, you may see the word Nebraska and it may not do a lot for you. But this trip is unbelievable. Leading it, being there with Rick Wright, who knows it as well as anybody, it's just a very special experience. I've done it three times and every time I loved it so much. Um, on my final slide here, I am going to actually, I do have a map here that shows the scope of this tour. Um, this, the trip starts and ends in Omaha, which as you can see is right on the Missouri River on the Iowa border. The trip does include a couple of, uh, it does include a morning of birding on the Iowa side. One thing that I want to point out here is Lake Manawa which is uh, right across the border outside the city of Council Bluffs. It is a large reservoir that is just chock full of waterfowl. Yes, the, 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 you could argue that the, the single biggest reason is to go there to see the Sandhill Cranes, but seeing just the huge numbers of waterfowl, like 200 canvas back in one flock, you know, 100 common mergansers together, that kind of thing. We go down uh, the Platte River. We go west from Omaha down to Grand Island. We, we go to Grand Island. We go down to Kearney. It looks like Kearney, but it's Kearney. And it is in that region that we focus on, on the Sandhill Crane Spectacles. And then we drop all the way down to McCook here, farther south and west, where we go to see the prairie chickens. And with the Sandhill Crane, we see them coming into roost, which is an amazing sight, how they drop out of the sky, and we see them taking off from their roost. It's extraordinary. So that is the final slide in the sequence here. And um, we are going to, uh, we're going to invite Kevin. We're going to talk with Kevin a little bit here. And then um, if anybody has any questions about anything they've heard here, we'll be glad to answer those. Kevin, um, do you want to chime in here, add anything that maybe you've, you've, you've been to some of these destinations, I believe, anything you want to add to this? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, nice presentation. I have been to uh, the California in the winter. Actually, my wife and I went to the San Diego Bird Festival this winter in January. And um, just to give you a testament of how good the birding is there, uh, it was the week that they had absolute dismal weather uh, for the festival there. And, um, you know, in one 20 minute span, we had hail, snow, rain and sunshine. Um, but uh, one of the field trips we laid out there for the uh, for the um, festival was your, you know, it was a century trip. So you had to, you were aiming to see 100 species in in a day and it rained three quarters of the day hard and we still got to 101 species. So it kind of just gives you the testament of how good the birding actually is in Southern California in the wintertime to where it can rain for three quarters of the day and you still get to 100 species. So uh, it's, a, it's a really, and just the scenery uh, along the coast there is absolutely beautiful and the mountains are as well. So um, I've been to Arizona in the wintertime. Uh, that uh, Sandhill Crane spectacle is phenomenal. It's not quite as good as I would say uh, um, Nebraska um, or even the Bosque del Apache, but it's still a really neat, uh, a really neat experience. Plus, you get a lot of raptors too. Gosh, I think the raptors are uh, are one of the best parts of that whole trip. Um, like Victor was saying, the phrygianus hawks, uh, and you see them in great numbers. So, um, the northern Minnesota trip, I have I've actually led that trip. 
five times and uh, it is cold, very cold. <laughs> but you know, you bundle up and it, you get a lot of, what I like to call it camaraderie with all your other uh, your participants because yeah, everybody's cold, right? You know, and uh, you know, you, it's interesting to go out the door in the morning and see negative uh, 10 on the, uh, on the um, thermometer in the car dashboard. And uh, so everybody has a good time kind of relating to that. Um, you don't go that far from the car, which is, uh, you know, so you get always a chance to come back and warm up. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of really nice tours. I want to go kind of now, like I, yeah. <laughs> you're making me really want to just uh, pick up and go. But um, yeah, so uh, thanks for putting us all together. That's really nice. Yeah, uh, for sure, Kevin. And I'm going to, uh, we're going to switch over uh, back uh, off the slideshow. We're going to, we're going to just talk here in real time for a moment. There we are. There we go. So, uh, everybody, as part of our as part of our welcoming Kevin to the vent team, I just want to tell a quick story about uh, about how we met Kevin and and how we now know him. Um, we have a traveler. Kevin used to work for another organization, and we had a traveler who had been with him before, um, and she was so enamored with Kevin and his leading style, uh, his knowledge base, his people skills. Uh, she traveled on, uh, she's been traveling on some vent tours recently. And uh, it was back in February of this year, I was on a trip uh, with her. And she took me aside and began telling me about this guy from Western North Carolina, uh, named Kevin Burke, who we just had to meet, we just had to know about him. And it just so happens that at this point in time, um, you know, Vent is in, has been interested in adding another tour leader or two. And so uh, one thing led to another. We were linked up with Kevin um, and we just sort of knew from the from the outset that this was going to be a great fit for 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 all of us. And so we do want to take this opportunity to welcome Kevin. Um, he'll be leading uh, a number of tours in the coming years and you can find him, his bio and the tours he will be leading by uh, on our on the vent website if you look at if you go under about vent and look under our team there you can find kevin's profile i called the lady after we talked to kevin who had recommended we hire him and i said you hit a home run that's <laughs> exactly what i was talking about <laughs> well, gosh don't make my head any bigger than it really already is you know <laughs> Uh, thank you for that, for sure. I'm super excited to be here. It's not lost on me how uh, how special it is to work for Vent and uh, and how um, just a, what, a, what a great group of professionals it is, you know. And just you know, on the on the about me or the uh, you know about, about Vent page, I'm right in between Ken Kaufman and Kevin Zimmer, so I'm in pretty good company right there on that line. Uh, I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> But, um, you know, in that and, and all of you listening today, you know, it's not lost on me. Um, there's plenty of ways to, uh, you know, spend your vacations and your money. And I truly appreciate all of the uh, all of you that sign up uh, on on our trips. I mean, it's it's uh, you know, again, not lost on me how special it is that you would sign up and go with us uh, on these trips um, to go see all these wonderful, uh, you know, birds and, and uh, all the other nature that we uh that we go and and, uh, and look for. So thank you very much. Um, I know there's a lot of my folks uh, that I have taken out um, before on these uh, on this uh, webinar here. So good to see you. I think even my mom. Hey, mom. So and uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm super excited to be here. And, um, you know, I've, I've been birding for uh, over 20 years um, and leading uh, in some capacity for you know, 15 of those, um, if not more. It's hard. It's kind of running together now. But uh, I'm just uh, excited to be here. And uh, and thanks again to uh, Barry and Victor. I'd add to what he said that in addition to the wonderful birds you see on a vet tour, it's the wonderful people you go birding with and the wonderful leaders you're with. One lady wrote me after going on a tour with David Escanio how much she liked it. She said, I had a wonderful trip, and now I have a new friend. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's how I like to run my tours too. Is once you're once you're uh, you know going on my tours, you're now in my flock. You know, so it's uh, it's uh, a lot of fun. I've made a lot of really good friends on these trips, and uh, you know, it's um, it's supposed to be fun. So we have a lot of fun. You know, we eat well. We do. Uh, <laughs> we uh, oh gosh, um, yeah. 
I was looking at all those tours in January. I don't know if my kids are going to know who I am by the time I get home, but um, <laughs> but it's going to be a lot of fun. So. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, and we also wanted to make one mention about the Nebraska presentation. It may have seemed to, to be a little shorter than the others, but that is because Rick Wright will be presenting a full featured presentation on that tour in the middle of September. So we will be uh, having that announcement in the near future. So if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to email me, ben at ventbird.com or the operations uh, team as Barry had displayed their information uh, in the previous slides. We wanna thank Kevin for joining us. And of course, Victor and Barry for the presentation. And thanks everybody in the vet community for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you in the field soon. Thank you. Thank you. And if you can't go, let somebody else know about it. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you.